as I was going through present, uh, preparing for this, um, I was circling all the speakers that I wanted to see, and then I found out that I was circling everything on the on the chart. So hopefully, you all did the same thing. I'm really so excited to be in the room um, with you all, and uh, it's an honor seeing the list of survivors and uh, long-term recovery groups it means a lot. That's where the work actually happens. Good 360 is. Um, we're a national nonprofit um, working internationally when we can. The national nonprofit space is a small world. We run into the same people in the same circles. Um, this is the next level and the next couple levels where the work really gets done at the long-term recovery group level and the alliances that you have. So the title of my presentation is From Heart to Hand, Mastering the Art of Effective Donations. I'll be talking about donation management. Um, I will say that I am a survivor of a fire. It was a house fire when I was 10 years old. It was not a mega fire. Um, the house did burn down. But we did have insurance. So I feel um, kind of tied to the topic in general. But JGT has really made this uh, important to me as a person. So uh, Good360 is a matchmaker, basically the easiest way to describe us. Uh, companies donate products to us, and then we find the right nonprofit in our network that matches up well. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to say no really, because what we do, uh, I really want to make sure that everybody that is in the space uh, that needs product to do what you're doing knows that we exist. We're a 501c3. Our mission is closing the need gap by getting products that are donated to nonprofits that need them. Uh, 400 plus manufacturers and retailers, 100,000 nonprofits that have used us at some point, um, about 8,000 a year that we work with. If the numbers get big, $2.5 billion worth of products. That's enormous even for us. Over the last three years, it's grown uh, five times. Um, but it's a drop in the bucket. The true number that's out there of excess goods is like $3 trillion of product that's out there that's good product that's get, getting thrown away by the, the retailers and manufacturers, believe it or not. Disaster, uh, we have worked, as you see, 33 states um, all, all over the US. Our superpowers uh, that we have are access to product donors. So we do have, um, you'll see Brooks Nelson uh, later, in the conference from Walmart Foundation. We met at the US Chamber, he's now there. Walmart, is Amazon, all the names that you would want to have working, if you only could, you can get them through us. So again, just kind of re restating a superpower. But we also work in logistics, so transportation, warehousing, uh, and thought leadership, uh, trying to do more in this space than just the transactional that I just described. And the bottom line for us is getting the right goods to the right people at the right time. And I sincerely mean that. That's If we don't do that, then we've done something wrong. It's all about timing, and I'll tell you how we try to do that. Some staggering stats. 60% um, of goods, this has been confirmed over several s studies. In disaster, 60% of goods donated end up in the landfill. They're known as unsolicited goods. It's known as the second disaster. You're all really familiar with it. You get lots and lots of stuff from well-meaning people and well-meaning companies, but it's the wrong stuff. So 60% of it actually gets thrown away, and you probably have helped do that, sort it, sort it, get it out, and throw it away, as opposed to what you really should be doing or want to do. The next stat is, to me, even more staggering. It's 12% of disaster funding is allocated to long-term recovery. I checked with the Center for Disaster Philanthropy last week, and the number in their most recent survey is 2%, which is ridiculous. 2% of funding for disaster goes to long-term recovery and mitigation. 90% of goes to response and relief, which is really important, but it's out of whack. So I'm showing these numbers for us all to know them, to work with our funders to try to get that to change. The last one is 80% of donations occur within the first six weeks of the disaster. It's the knee-jerk reaction. I want to do something. All the money gets donated up front, and there's very, very little left to go to long-term recovery. Okay, um, so what we did to try to help our corporate funders and product donors is to come up with six tenants 
that will help them to do a better job of donating in disaster. And I'll, I'll put it out there that we're looking at this again for this year and looking for changes to it. I think there's a couple of things missing that have happened over the last couple of years that says nothing about vulnerable populations and a couple of really important things. But I do like the approach. So when we talk to companies, we say the first thing you need to do is be proactive. Don't just sit and wait for something to happen and then decide what you're gonna do. Set up your partners ahead of time in the community, get a business plan together, figure out what funding you can have that you could utilize for disaster. Do all of that ahead of time. Second one is needs-based. This is probably the most critical, to avoid that unsolicited goods problem. Determine what are the true needs. Ask somebody who's working on the ground, what do you need? Don't send stuff just because you think they need it. And that goes for boxes, pallets, truckloads, and containers. The horror stories are out there for what has been sent to disasters, uh, including prom dresses, um, to different disasters. So needs-based, get information. Again, this is for corporate uh, ears, which we don't have many here, but again, I'm looking for feedback as well. Immediate and long-term, so we've talked about that already. Just don't focus on funding short-term, look at the long-term as well. Transparent, so being clear on the fact that you are supporting long-term recovery, and then educational, telling others about it. Last one, most important, resilience. Taking steps to leave the community better off than it was. We'll probably hear the word resilience 100 times in this conference. Uh, it's got lots of definitions, but we know that it means being able to bounce back faster, making sure that when a disaster happens of any kind, we're ready for it next time. This is a quick slide because <laughs> I am not going to go through it. Um, this is what I think I know from JGT and from other research about wildfires. We are, I did bring my team together for what we call Wildfires 101. We've had 102. We wanna learn more about what's happening in wildfires so that we can do a better job of helping you and your communities do more. So this is what I think I know, which are tons of interesting facts, but you probably already know them from your personal experience. What we really wanna talk about is the future, putting teeth behind the word resilience, thinking when working ahead to limit disaster and get a speedy recovery. So in, now that you know that I'm an avid student, uh, student of wildfires, this is what we've learned from, from Maui so far, uh, because we're still active. Not pre-positioning product hurt our ability to respond effectively. We didn't prepare our partners, we did not have product in Maui, on Maui, that was needed right away. Mostly what was needed was personal protective equipment. A shortage, a mass shortage um, of that because it was such a devastating fire in an area that did not have PPE or, or other agencies that had product. Uh, few, few agencies were prepared. Local, local, local. So the Hawaiian culture is unique and that has really shaped the recovery. Listening to the people on the ground. You all know this, if you've seen one disaster, you've seen one disaster. What I've learned is if you see one wildfire recovery, you've seen one wildfire recovery. They're all different. Um, it's really important to dig into the locals, find out what's happening, and not make assumptions. Long-term recovery for Maui is gonna look and feel completely different than others that are in the room. Um, they're only, they're, they're rebuilding where they can, but they're gonna have to figure out who owns the land, uh, are there titles to it? Um, can you build on it? Is it too toxic? When can you build back? All those things are gonna take months and years. And then the cleanup phase and debris removal is always dangerous. Um, this one there is a tough one to project for them because the area was so drastically hit. So again, in preparation for this, I pulled a slide and shared this with Jen beforehand. And she's, what do you think she asked me? What's missing? As far as the key areas, there's, there's no wildfire. Yeah, fire. There's no wildfires indicated on this. So I looked for more, and I found this, which I thought was really helpful. <laughs> so that probably was too simple. So then I used AI, which is all the intelligence, 
and looked up a bunch of different maps, which were helpful and confusing at the same time. So then I looked to see where the, the safest areas were so that I could sleep at night, which most of us in the room know that even these safest states have had things happen to them. So it's not, there is no safe place. I think Michigan's probably the least so far. But we need to be prepared for anything is the point. So the need gap. Um, again, there's $3 trillion, uh, $3, 3 trillion worth of product that's available. How do we get it where it's needed? Uh, it's stuff, um, but it needs to turn into products that can be used. So the goal is to reduce that number of 60% and get it in the hands of survivors faster. Um, what we found is the major challenge is warehouse space. You just don't have the capability to bring in truckloads of product. You don't have the ability to sort it. Um, it makes unsolicited goods unmanageable, not having warehouse space. You can't take a mixed truckload in and sort it. Uh, Long-term recovery products are received too early and then they're rejected. So there's a big problem around warehousing. For corporates, um, they wanna offer things but if you don't have warehouse space, they can't give it to you, so they throw it away. And uh, multiple other problems. So we've created a network um, of shared warehouse space that was funded by the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. And fortunately, we have also got a lot of participating nonprofits who give us space. Just a couple of examples of what this means. Uh, Mayfield Lake Graves Long-Term Recovery Group we went in on a warehouse with them uh, as part of their, their actual uh, lease. Uh, Lyft Logistics in Jacksonville, we share a space there, and that's a hub for, for the Caribbean as well as Florida and other south, uh, southeast states. New Life Missions, they share space with us, and we, sh we give them product, kind of a one for you, one for us. And then pro bono space from companies. Uh, disaster Relief by Amazon, I'm a big fan of theirs. They are very, very uh, engaged in disaster. They gave a warehouse in Fort Myers that was not being used that became the multi-agency warehouse. It was fantastic. So everybody that was working in that space could come pick up product, store product. Um, and we have smaller locations with ARS Gem and GAF in Mobile, Alabama. Benefits again, so reduce time to get product in the field, you're able to sort things, you're able to accept and store offers that are year round, you can create a multi-agency warehouse, and allows Good360 to help in ways that we wouldn't otherwise be able to help. This is our map of where we are now uh, with Shared Warehouse, and again, what's missing. Right? We have one location in California. So I'm looking for help. Um, if you can help us there, you'll also notice that Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Alaska aren't on here. We need help there. But in California, I'm thinking that you may know some folks that could help. We're working with national partners like Global Empowerment Mission, but also Tool Bank USA, Team Rubicon, Salvation Army, Habitat. Those are all potential warehouse locations for us in California. We're already working with Orville Hope Center, uh, United Way of uh, Mid Willamette, City Serve. So those are other partners that may join us. But again, if you are able to identify warehouse space where in your community that we could utilize, that would be fantastic. Companies again, Amazon will help us um, where they can, and ARS Gem. But again, let me know where we can help you. So I'm going to stop there because I don't think there's many companies uh, in the room, and I do have some do's and don'ts for them but I wanted to see if there's any questions. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that in the, I'm from Oregon in the Santa Am Canyon region for the Beachy Creek Lionheads fire. And if it wasn't for Good360, like we wouldn't be able to get households recovered as fast as we have been able to. Um, I know like we have a, we have a hall on site and our long-term recovery manager is bringing in stuff every week. So I just wanted to say thank you for the program. It's been amazing for our survivors. Thank you. That means a lot. It really does. So it does work. Uh, we find a way to make it work. Again, if it's a high volume, we'll figure it out. Um, but the most important thing is that, you know, my two hats that I wear are going out and getting funding to make sure this is free 
for nonprofits that work in the disaster space and to get the product that you need because of what you're telling me. That's what I do. That's what Good360 does. It's too good to believe, right? It's free. So my major goal is to say, here I am. Talk to me if you have needs. Take my card. Uh, let us know what you need, and we'll get it to you. And also the ask is, if you have warehouse space locations that you can offer up as ideas, I'll do the legwork on it and track it down. Uh, so uh, again, from Oregon, uh, we've created or had some legislation passed recently to create community resilience hubs that can do some of this um, work of, um, you know, creating uh, you know community resilience hubs that, that preposition some goods and services and whatnot in in place. But I'm wondering if the prepositioned goods that you're talking about or the, uh, that would have benefited Lahaina and potentially other um, communities, what are sort of the high level things that you're trying to preposition in different communities and does it vary depending on where they are? Yeah, it's a great question and it's really good to hear that. My daughter lives in Lincoln City, so um, Oregon is near and dear to my heart. Um, so prepositioning, we have two categories of warehouse. One is response and one is recovery. Response means that we want to get product for shelters and early activities as fast as possible. So that's blankets, um, water, uh, anything that a shelter would ask for up front. So early, early needs. The, the more challenging one is long-term recovery, which requires more space. That's where we want to put furniture, shingles, other building supplies, mattresses, and household goods. So those are the two definitions. The response is so that we can do what we can do. If we don't, if we don't preposition uh, response items, we're not going to be effective. It just takes too long to get the ask and where they're going. Um, if we do preposition, they're there in the same day because our partners will get them to us uh, out in the field. The long-term recovery is the more important. So I'd love to talk to you later about uh, what you're thinking there and how we might be able to fit into that program because I can't tell you that my passion right now is about this disaster warehouse space because I think it could really make a difference for everybody if we can figure it out and we all share in that space together. Hi, yes. thank you. Uh, logistics can be very complex. Sounds like you deal with products that are bulk as well as flat pack. Do you manage the logistics network or do the companies rely on whatever they have in place or does the government tell you, here, have a train? How does that work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Do you ever get a whole train? <laughs> I'll take a train. Uh, yes, so uh, superpower is logistics. So we do have a transportation team that works every day. We, you know, the high level is, do you have this product? And then immediately we go to, all right, now tell us all about it. How many pallets? What's the weight? What are the pallet dimensions? Can it be picked up? And then on the receiving end, do you have a pallet jack? Do you have a forklift? Do you have space? All the warehouse things. So yes, our best partners are logistics folks. We're really, really fortunate to have the UPS Foundation as a partner. So they help us a lot with active disasters, but we leverage other partners, even Amazon Transportation, Flexport, uh, others that can help us. And we, get, you, we use that funding for that. The most expensive thing right now for us, 30% of our costs are shipping. But we take that on for you, so you don't have that again. So I think I'm I'm less last person. Yes. It, just just really quick. I just actually kudos to you guys. My fire was 2007. Good 360, one and a half million dollars in in kind items donated to our 500 fire families wow. over for the long term recovery. Just a great partner, and it's just really nice to see you guys here today and still continuing on that. You guys mission. are trying to make me cry. It's yes. Too easy. Um, I love hearing that. That's exactly what we want to Did do. Did the Clintons ever so, make you cry, Jim? <laughs> the Clintons? <laughs> the Clintons. <laughs> Did you want to do me? Do you want me to do my Bill Clinton for you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry we couldn't make that. Uh, as long conference. as you keep it to voice only. But I brought him with me. <laughs> you want to play Hillary? No, I mean, well, yeah, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Um, hmm. 
Yes. Also, I mean, it is that I love. Uh, thank you, Jim, so much for being here. But also because we all know that when you guys are all ready for a couch, there's no couches to be had. The number of companies that offer, you know, have a couch or a mattress like in the first six weeks. And you're like, I don't have a home. We're going to put that on my ash. My, It's very different from wind and rain where you do need a couch or a mattress so much sooner. Mm -hmm. And getting into that learning curve is massive because really sometimes it's three years later when you need that couch and all of those offers are gone think about it right now how many news stories have you even seen about maui in the past three weeks mm -hmm. none pretty much mm -hmm. yeah. it's not going to happen and, nope. and what i've been hearing here is what you've told me which is they're one they're one-offs somebody will finish their house then the next one starts in in hurricanes and floods a neighborhood is affected everybody's working at the same time it's a water damage issue. You get the bad stuff out, you put the new stuff in, and you're done. With fires, it's gone. You start from scratch, which well, is like We don't have dramatic. anything left to muck or tarp. No mucking, gutting, tarping. No. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Find Thank Jim. You. Talking about warehouse space. Thank, Thank you so you. much.